turn the mic on. Didn't. So to repeat what we just said, uh, he summarizes the determinist argument as everything we do is caused by forces over which we have no control. If that's true, then we have no free will. And when you combine those two claims, then the conclusion is we have no free will. So if you accept all three of these, the two premises and the conclusion, as true, then you basically um, are a hard determinist, like Laplace and like de Holbach. If you reject the second premise, I'm, I'm sorry, if you reject the first, let's go back to that. Um, you are a libertarian. You deny that everything we do, every choice, is caused by forces that are not under our control. And we're going to see Sartre's brand of libertarianism next week. But, but also, I mean, the libertarians we've met up with have been anybody from Socrates and Plato through Augustine, through Aquinas, and um, you know, down to modern people like Descartes. And usually they've thought that not everything we do is determined by our causal history because they think of us as more than just a material being. But you can reject the second premise. In other words, you can assume that determinism is true, which is essentially what premise one says. Everything we do is determined by our causal past causal history, but you can say, no, premise two is false. Um, it's not true that if that's the case, then we have no free will. There's a sense of free will that is compatible um, with our having everything, every choice we make uh, determined by our past causal history. Um, and so they deter, compatibilists that claim that determinism and moral responsibility are compatible. That even if everything is determined by prior causes, whether it's genetics plus environment or just our atomic makeup, they hold there's a sense of freedom that makes it sensible, that gives us a way to say we have genuine moral responsibility. Now, if you look down at the very bottom of this slide, you'll see a distinction between metaphysical and moral freedom. Okay? Compatibilists along with hard determinists, deny that we have metaphysical freedom. In other words, to have metaphysical freedom is to not have every choice you make determined by prior causes. Um, but both hard determinists and soft determinists deny that we have metaphysical freedom. They say everything we do is determined by prior causes. But they say there's another sense of freedom of action, call it moral freedom, that is compatible with moral responsibility, even if we have no metaphysical freedom. And basically, um, now this covers up the blackboard, but a good way to say it is, for a compatibilist, we have moral freedom if our choices are determined by, or by some internal state of the agent. 
Um, in other words, moral freedom means one's choices are determined by some inner psychological state. And if you look up uh, here, behavior that is caused by one's desires, in other words, I really desire to make a cup of coffee in the morning, or one's beliefs, I believe that this is the right thing to do now, or, you know. Um, and decisions that you make. In, a, in other words, you see what they're saying is, if you're doing what you want to do, or what you believe is the right thing to do, then you're acting freely in enough sense of freedom for us to say you're morally responsible for that decision, whether it's a good decision or a bad decision. Uh, so, but there's, you know, other types of behaviors that they say are, are not free. So let, let me move on here. So metaphysical freedom then means we're free from having our choices determined by our causal past. It's not true. If metaphysical freedom is something we have, then it's not true that our causal past determines our current choices. We have, if we have metaphysical freedom, then given the same causal past, we could have chosen differently than we did. To have metaphysical freedom is to say, if all the prior causes that led up to my choosing A rather than B were in place, I could just as easily have chosen to do B because I have metaphysical freedom and my past causal history isn't determining my choice. Now, both hard and soft determinists deny that we have this kind of metaphysical freedom. In other words, for both of them, um, given our past causal history, and given that it's the same, we could not have chosen otherwise than we did. Our choice for both hard determinists and soft determinists, in other words, soft determinism and compatibilism are two words for the same thing. They both hold that if our past causal history was the same, our choice is going to be the same because our choice is determined by our past causal history. But you can, what you say, well, let's hear a little bit more about the kind of freedom. Now, I, I, I'm going to shut this because... Professors get too excited. <laughs> I know what we're talking about. We, we had the same thing going on last night, my night class. I said, hey, can you close the door? And, and there's a guy who's, uh, I, I, I know him because we kind of share an office, you know. And he's probably in his 40s and he's really going on. I said, yeah, yeah, I, I, that's what I used to do. I'm a little more sedate. But um, I'm, I'm not a big watcher of television, period. Uh, but occasionally, I've watched, uh, what is it, Ellen? And sometimes at the beginning of the show, she'll say, hey, I feel like dancing, you know? And she'll dance a little bit, right? And you can say, well, Ellen made that choice freely because that's what she wanted to do then, right? dance a little in front of the audience. 
So moral freedom is the kind of freedom that compatibilists say is enough freedom for moral responsibility. So an action or behavior is moral, morally free if and only if it is caused by the agent's own beliefs, desires, and decisions. In other words, by some internal mental state of the agent. It, it doesn't have to be limited to beliefs, desires, and decisions. Um, so an action can be morally free even if physically even if physical determinism is true. If uh, in dancing I did what I really wanted to do then, my choice to dance was free morally. But you can say, but your desire to dance then was determined. Now, I'm taking a sip of coffee, right? Usually the first thing I do when I get up in the morning. I use this old Melita system. I still think it makes a pretty good cup of coffee where I heat water in a tea kettle and pour it over a filter, uh, you know, rather than like percolators that keep on boiling the same coffee. That's what my parents used to make coffee in. But anyway, uh, and you say, well, you're doing what you want to do, what you desire to do, Murawski, right? You got up in the morning, you desired to make a cup of coffee, and you did it. But you can say, well, but wait a second, I didn't always desire to have a cup of coffee in the morning. You know, some choices made me into a coffee drinker. I actually worked at a coffee house in the 60s when, uh, when, when they had real on-stage performers. You know, one, one of the last ones in Baltimore at the time. Uh, this was when I was in high school. And the, the thing is, you know, hey, I, I n never liked coffee the way my parents fixed it with tons of cream and sugar. And I thought, man, I don't like coffee. But then I discovered that we served espresso along with regular coffee. I thought, I like espresso. What's going on here? And then I realized, well, you don't put anything in espresso. You know, it's just black coffee, right? At, and so I tried regular coffee that way. I thought, oh, I like this. <laughs> and we had a very good brand of coffee for the time. So, um, you know, so I sort of made myself into a coffee drinker. But you can say, well, you wouldn't have had that desire if it weren't for things in your causal past. So, you know, it raises the question, do you need your desires to be free as well? Or if you're doing what you desire to do, but your causal history is what determines your desire. I mean, there was a time when I smoked a pipe, right? I mean, I used to have that written into my employment contract. They said, if you're going to be a philosophy professor, uh, you have to convey a certain professional image. So you will grow a beard, you will smoke a pipe. If you're going to be a philosophy professor, you got to look like one, right? <laughs> you know, so then one of the first things you want to do in the morning, besides make a cup of coffee, is, you know, light up your pipe. Now, I haven't done that for years and years and years, but, uh, you know, but, but some things in my past determined me to have that desire. I no longer have that desire. So moral freedom and moral responsibility. We, we're morally responsible, says the compatibilist, for and can reasonably be either punished for uh, those acts that are caused by our own desires and decisions or even rewarded if they're heroic acts. So in defense of their view, compatibilists argue that 
what they call moral freedom, the kind that's compatible with determinism, is all that's required by ordinary common sense and in many cases by the law. Strict liability laws notwithstanding. Uh, when we decide whether someone is morally responsible. In, in other words, did they do this freely, you know? And let's, let's go back to Leopold and Lowe, because I've, I've got a question that will be an option of the final. Right, Clarence Darrow, a hard determinist, argues that uh, it's their causal history that's all we need to look at to see that, uh, you know, there are significant mitigating factors in their genes, but also in their in, uh, environmental conditions growing up that should be mitigating and, and, and should lead us to conclude that their decisions weren't really their own, you know, but the result of past causes. And so we should not hold them entirely responsible for planning this murder. We should, in, and, and we shouldn't give them the death penalty. But a compatibilist looking at that might say, well, look, yeah, it's true that their causal history maybe determined them to have um, the desires to commit the perfect crime or the murder, various things in their causal past. But a compatibilist could say, listen, they meticulously planned this thing out. This wasn't a spur of the moment thing, you know. I mean, the, the person they killed was a neighbor, you know. They, they were going to target a specific individual. And they wanted to commit the perfect crime. So a compatibilist could say, well, Clarence Darrow is simply wrong. Leopold and Loeb were doing what they desired and wanted to do in committing that murder, so we should hold them fully responsible morally for what they did. So it's possible for a compatibilist to come out with a different slant on, you know, moral and legal responsibility. And, and we think about this, um, well, here's, this is kind of far-fetched, his example, but somebody misses the final exam, right, because they hit the snooze button too much on their alarm clock or just turned it off and went back to bed. You say, well, you know, they should be responsible for that. They, they could have gotten up and out of bed, but instead they uh, chose to lay in bed some more and they fell back asleep and missed the exam. But suppose somebody had uh, robbed your house in the morning and it tied you up and put you in the closet, right? And you had an exam the next morning but you couldn't make it because you're tied up in the closet, right? And the robber has left. Well, you know, clearly in the second instance, you shouldn't really be held responsible for things that were beyond your own, you know, cause. You didn't say, please, you know, you weren't a, what is it, masochist? please tie me up and lock me in the closet, you wouldn't say. Or, or I mean, consider we're talking about cars, right? Um, you're driving down North Avenue, and you're at a red light, and somebody flashes a, a gun in your face and says, I want your car. Well, 
if you turn the vehicle over toward them, well, you do it for self-preservation, but it isn't what you wanted to do. You weren't sitting there saying, gee, I wish somebody would hijack my car right now and take it away from me. Or, or suppose, that, uh, I mean, to alter the example a little bit. And I once saw this. I, I went a year to a little college in downtown D.C., right? And I'm sitting there, and the, some of the dorms were actually in private in houses, right? And not, so I'm lo looking out the window, you know, I hear what sound like shots, and I'm practicing my guitar. And I see two guys running down the street. Both of them have small pistols, and occasionally one would stop and turn and shoot, and the person in front had a bag. And the person in back, I came to find out that the person in front was a robber, and he had just stole that bag of cash, and the person in back was somebody who worked at the place and was after him, and neither of them was a good shot. Uh, I mean, one thing, that if, 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 so, if a situation like that could be funny at all, right, here's this guy in this little sports car, I think it was a Sprint or Sprite or something, and he stopped at the red light, right? And there's other cars, and there's nowhere he can go. And, and the top staff. So here come these guys from the other side of the street. One runs in front of his, you know, both of them have guns. One of them runs in front of his car, the other runs in back, and he's like in the middle. But, um, but I mean, suppose somebody, you know, has just robbed a bank and you're seated at a red light, and they come in and they say, look, drive, the cops are after me. I just robbed the bank, don't stop for anything. You know, uh, so they want to use your car as their getaway car, and, and they've got a gun in your ribs, right? So you go through three red lights, and you know, you're driving 30 miles above the speed limit, Right now, suppose they set up a roadblock and 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 app, you know apprehended the guy gives up. Right now, wouldn't it seem strange if one of the officers then walks up to you and says, "Well, okay, we clocked you going through three red lights, and you also were uh, you know at least 30 miles above the speed limit, so we're going to write you tickets for all this." You would say, well, no, you know, the guy had a gun in your ribs, right? You didn't really have the free choice to do that, you know. Um, and, and so, so, in other words, if you're coerced by something external like that, you know, the robber puts you in the closet and you miss the exam, the, you know, or the bank robber has a Get into your ribs. Or you, you did something that you thought was unethical on your job, but, you know, your boss says, look, uh, you need to fudge these figures some, and if you don't do it, it's your job. And, you know, so there can be subtle coercion. But in, in cases like that, Compatibilists would tend to say, you weren't really free. You did, you had, you did not have moral freedom, and so you shouldn't be held responsible for what you did. So that's how they can make the uh, distinction, and that, you know, so, so at any rate, um, you know, this just goes into that in more, uh, detail. But, but that's basically, but compatibilism again, um, you know, assumes that if all things were the same, I could not have chosen differently. And if we want freedom of the will, do we want to be able to say that even if my causal history was the same, 
I still could have chosen differently. If, if that's the version of freedom of the will you think is the best version, then compatibilism is not for you. Because it says, if my causal history was the same, I could not have chosen differently. Um, Well, yeah, and, and right, right, and this comes to... statistical. If you've done things in the past, there's a high probability that you're going to do the same stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 right. Or, or, I mean, was there a case where you could have, I could have chosen not to be a coffee drinker, you know, even if I'm more or less determined to be one... Now, you know, no, it, it raises some good questions. Well, I don't want to make any of you late for your next class, but next time, I, 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 I'm not going to get worried about the reading on this. I may look at it some next time. I, I can of read it again. Uh, but but um, Satra, I'd, I'd like to at least, um, for two reasons, do some of Satra. It gives us a taste of, continental philosophy in the 20th century, which is a different slant on philosophy, but also, you know, it gives us one version of libertarianism that's not religiously based, like um, Augustine's and Aquinas's would, um, you know. So uh, there's a PowerPoint that's visible on Sartre there, there you might want to look at. Uh, okay, if anyone missed the roll, uh, sign it on the way out. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't want to uh, cut you off, but...